At the beginning of the 8th century, Iberia, Spain and Portugal had been ruled for 200 years by the Visigoths, who had invaded from eastern Germany. They were a barbarian people ruled by Roderick, the Gothic king of Spain whose court was in Toledo. By 708 AD, the Arab armies had invaded and advanced across North Africa to the Atlantic Ocean. All of Morocco was subdued except Ceuta, which was opposite Spain, separated by the Straits, a distance of only nine miles. An African chief, a convert to Islam during the Arab invasion of Morocco, was a great general named Tariq. He was given the rank of general in the Arab armies and the governorship of Mauritania by Musa ibn Nusser, the Arab governor of North Africa. Tariq had befriended Count Julian, governor of Ceuta, and discovered that he wanted revenge against his master, Roderick, for dishonoring his daughter. Thus urged to invade Spain, Tariq then informed Musa of his intention to cross the Straits to explore the possibilities for an invasion. In 710, a small army under General Tariq, composed of 400 men and 100 horses, invaded Spain, plundered the town of Algeciras, as well as neighboring towns, and returned to Africa, their boats laden with spoils. With this event, one of the most important productive and progressive epochs of world history began and would continue for nearly 800 years. Through this empire of the Moors, the foundations for many institutions of modern Europe were laid. Further, the way for the explorations of the Spaniards and Portuguese that led to the finds in the New World and Africa was prepared during the time of the Moors in Al-Andalus as their empire in Europe came to be known. Historian Stanley Lane Poole states in the story of the Moors in Spain, on April 30th, 711 AD, encouraged by the success of Tarif's invasion, Tariq led an army of 7,000 men, of which 6,700 were native Africans, Moors, and 300 were Arabs. After crossing the straits and landing on the Spanish coast, Tariq seized a steep cliff and ordered a fortress to be built upon the advantageous spot. His troops named the site Gabel Tariq, the Hill of Tariq, later to be known as Gibraltar. Tariq went on to capture Algeciras and Cartaya. As he progressed through the countryside, many Spanish natives eagerly joined him to fight the ruling Visigoths. On the 18th of July, Tariq, with about 14,000 troops, defeated Roderick and his 60,000 troops. Who were these Moors who could so successfully invade and conquer what was a strong and well-established kingdom in southern Europe, that of the Visigoths, who had, in their time, taken Iberia from the Roman Empire. As we have seen, the forces led by Tariq were black Africans, Moroccan Berbers, and a small number of Arabs. Those Africans had, over time and through the conquests of Islam, come as far as the regions of present-day Kenya and Ethiopia in East Africa and Mali and Senegal in Southwest Africa. The Moorish Empire was clearly an African one. As historian Dr. Chancellor Williams describes them, the original Moors, like the original Egyptians, were black Africans. As amalgamation became more and more widespread, only the Berbers, Arabs, and coloreds in the Moroccan territories were called Moors, while the darkest and black-skinned Africans were called Blackamoors. Eventually, black was dropped from Blackamoor. And as a European scholar of that time described them, the reins of their horses were as fire their faces black as pitch, their eyes shone like burning candles, their horses were swift as leopards, and the riders fiercer than a wolf in the sheepfold at night. We are all familiar with Shakespeare's Otello the Moor. These same Africans and Arabs were followers of Muhammad, Muslims. As we will learn, their early allegiance was to Damascus in Syria. Later, because they developed and wielded their own great power and influence in the Islamic world, that center of loyalty and allegiance would shift to within their own Al-Andalus. After Tariq's first victories, he went on to win more battles and conquer more land and cities. Toledo, Elvira, and Cordoba were among those that fell to Tariq's armies. 
Toledo was actually handed over to the invading Tariq by the Jews of the city, who also supplied him with arms and horses. According to historian Stanley Lane Poole, Cordoba was left in the keeping of the Jews because they had been staunch allies of the Muslims during the campaign. The Moors granted the Jews great considerations and never persecuted them as the Gothic priests had done. Within three years, the conquest of Iberia was complete and these Moorish warriors retired into Spain and proceeded to build a new kingdom. And what a kingdom it would be. Europe and what we call the Western world would change forever. The distinguished historian Basil Davidson declares that there were no lands at that time, the 8th century, more admired by its neighbors or more comfortable to live in than the rich African kingdom which took shape in Spain. When Tariq and his armies arrived in Iberia, Europe was in the midst of its dark ages. The Visigoths, who ruled Iberia at the time, according to Wayne Chandler, were a vigorous, rather barbaric people who, as Christians, believed in religious compensation for their vices. The key word here is barbaric. Writers of the time offer such descriptions as, they are nearer animals than men. They are by nature unthinking and their manners crude. Their bellies protrude, their color is white, and their hair is long. In sharpness and delicacy of spirit and in intellectual understanding, they are nil. Ignorance, lack of reasoning power, and boorishness are common among them. Elsewhere in Europe, life was similar. In his History of the Crusades, the Moorish writer Michaud describes the Prussians of the 13th century as just a few stages above savagery. In an essay, Edward Scobie writes, the palaces of the then rulers of Germany, France, and England were, when compared with those of the Moorish rulers of Spain and Portugal, scarcely better than the stables of the Moors. With the arrival of the Moors, a time of advanced civilization and enlightenment began in Europe. They brought with them from Africa their vast knowledge in many fields. They had access to and drew upon the knowledge of the previous African scholars, Egyptians, Ethiopians, and the Greeks. The Kingdom of Al-Andalus would establish institutions that would last until the present day and serve to enrich and enlighten Europe. Legends and mythologies were created through which the people of the Islamic world and of Christian Europe would until now secure their identities, beliefs, and values. Legends such as the Song of Roland from France, King Arthur and the Crusades, Lancelot and the Black Knight, Saint Maurice, a patron saint in the traditions of the Germanic peoples, Antar and Ziryab, the great Moorish singer, musician, and stylist, came from the time of this great empire. Science, philosophy, navigation, mathematics, and more were taught and developed. The cultures of Spain, Portugal, Sicily, France, Britain, and the Slovak countries were all positively influenced by this contact. We too, in our time, must give credit for our lives and culture to these Moors. The cities of Córdoba, Toledo, Granada, Sevilla, Coimbra, and Lisbon were their greatest achievements since they embodied all of the other contributions and have been the longest lasting. According to Stanley Lane Poole, we learn, Cordova in the 10th century was very much like a modern city. Its streets were well paved and there were raised sidewalks for pedestrians. At night, one could walk for 10 miles by the light of lamps, flanked by an uninterrupted extent of buildings. This was hundreds of years before there was a paved street in Paris, France, or a street lamp in London, England. The population of Cordova was over a million. There were 200,000 homes, 800 public schools, and many colleges and universities. Cordova possessed 10,000 palaces of the wealthy, besides many royal palaces surrounded by beautiful gardens. There were even 5,000 mills in Cordova at a time when there was not even one in the rest of Europe. There were also 900 public baths, besides a large number of private ones, at a time when the rest of Europe considered bathing as extremely sinful and to be avoided as much as possible. 
Cordova was also graced by a system of over 4,000 public markets. The great mosque of Cordova, another grand structure, had a scarlet and gold roof with 1,000 columns of porphyry and marble. It was lit by more than 200 silver chandeliers containing more than 1,000 silver lamps burning perfumed oil. Imagine a city in the 10th century with street lamps. The inhabitants of Moorish cities like Granada, Cordova, and Toledo in the 12th and 13th centuries enjoyed a style of life that would not be achieved in Paris or London until centuries later. The Great Mosque, still known by its Islamic name, the Mesquita, is one of the great Islamic sites in Cordoba. It is no longer used as a mosque. According to tradition, the original mosque was built on a site which was shared with the Christian church. Stanley Lane Poole tells us that, among the great architectural beauties of Cordoba, the principal mosque held and still holds the first place. It was begun in 784 by the first Abderrahman, who spent 8,000 pieces of gold upon it, which he got from the spoils of the Goths. Hisham, his pious son, completed it in 793 with the proceeds from the sacking of Narbonne. Each succeeding sultan added some new beauty to the building. Also located in Cordoba is the Alcazar, a great palace begun in 1328 by the Christian king Alfonso XI. This palace has significance because it was built during the time when the Moors still reigned in Spain. Its architectural style and gardens have been mostly influenced by the styles of the Moors. It is clear in this instance how much Moorish influence permeated the life of Al-Andalus even after the defeat of local Moorish monarchs. It was at the Alcazar that the last of the Moorish kings, Boabdil el Chico of Granada, lived as a captive of the Catholic monarchs, King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella. And it was here that these same monarchs received Columbus before he started on his first voyage. In Granada, we can still find some of the most striking, beautiful, and important of the palaces and fortifications left from this empire, particularly the Alhambra and the Generalife, as we look at the Alhambra, we see a complex of palaces which includes the fortress of the Alcazaba. The earliest references to fortifications on this site is 888 to 912, during the reign of Abdallah, the Emir of Al-Andalus. This reference is to a castle that protected its troops. After being abandoned, it was rebuilt and enlarged, we learn in the essay by Dario Rodriguez, by the Jew Samuel ibn Nagrala for the purpose of protecting the Jewish quarter. In 1238, the construction of the complex as it has become was started by Muhammad I. Enlargement, strengthening of the fortifications and refinements continued generation to generation until the reign of Muhammad V during the late 14th century. When Ferdinand and Isabella took over the Alhambra in 1492, they declared it a royal residence as testimony to their conquest of the Moors. This initiated the maintenance and preservation of the Moorish palace, the only one that remains nearly intact and well-preserved until today. Using advanced drainage and irrigation systems, reservoirs and aqueducts, the Moors kept the surrounding countryside fertile and productive and established efficient marketing transportation, and trading networks. According to Jan Carew, the Moors also brought the countryside into their cities with fantastic gardens, parks, lush inner courtyards, and a constant supply of pure water. The gardens in Moorish cities, both public and private ones, were known as paradises, a fitting term with which to describe those exquisite botanical marvels. The water wheel was another significant contribution of the Moors to the life of Al-Andalus. The remains of one of their wheels can be seen today at the Guadalquivir River in Cordoba. This enhancement, with its extensive irrigation systems, not only allowed for the cultivation of existing crops, but as well 
the introduction of new crops, such as cotton, rice, sugarcane, dates, ginger, lemons, and strawberries. It also made possible the driving of machines and the development of gardens and landscapes of unsurpassed beauty. Water was put to use to benefit the people at large. Through the images we see in the Generalife with its fountains and cascades, we can confirm the level of sophisticated technological development that the Moors introduced and refined in Al-Andalus. A most obvious and important one being the introduction of baths and the habit of bathing. During the arrival of the Moors, the people of Europe were discouraged from bathing by both religious and so-called medical powers. It was preached and believed that by exposing one's humors, pseudo-medical, spiritual elements of the body, one became vulnerable to bad spirits that brought sickness and disease. Water played a very important part in the religious ritual of the Moors. Pure, clean water was used not only to clean the body, but to enhance, beautify, and enrich the earth and the environment, as well as to provide a music to enrich the soul. In summarizing this first part, we have learned that the Moors arrived in Spain in 711 AD as conquerors. They settled there and proceeded to build the new kingdom of Al-Andalus, a civilization of great learning and architectural achievement. Join us as we look in greater detail in part two at the remarkable ways in which the Moors bridged the cultural gap between the ancient civilizations of Egypt and Greece and those of the modern era. <laughs> The legacy of the Moors is vast and deeply rooted. In truth, the Moors laid the foundations for the civilization of Southern Europe and greatly influenced other cultures of Western Europe. In science, mathematics, music, literature, etc., the Moors brought cutting-edge revelations as well as the ancient knowledge from Egypt and Greece. The universities and schools that were created and developed in Al-Andalus became known throughout the world for their refinement. The few universities in existence at the time in the rest of Europe quickly adopted the standards of their Moorish leaders and set about copying and collecting Moorish books with which to stock their libraries. In his book, Moorish Spain, Richard Fletcher writes of this legacy, the most fortunate beneficiaries of this coexistence were neither Christian nor Muslim Spaniards but the uncouth barbarians beyond the Pyrenees. The creative role of Islamic Spain in the shaping of European intellectual culture is still not widely enough appreciated. Apart from anything else, it is a most remarkable story. The scientific and philosophical learning of Greek and Persian antiquity was inherited by the Arabs in the Middle East. Translated, codified, elaborated by Arabic scholars, the corpus was diffused through the culturally unified world of classical Islam in the 9th and 10th centuries until it reached the limits of the known world in the West. And there, in Spain, it was discovered by the scholars of the Christian West, translated into Latin mainly between 1150 and 1250, and channeled off to irrigate the dry pastures of European intellectual life. The rediscovery of Aristotle's works by this route decisively changed the European mind. Navigational devices such as the Astrolab made possible the voyages of discovery to east and west. Newton's work would have been inconceivable without the knowledge of mathematics transmitted through Spain. The advances in medical science of the 17th century were grounded upon Arabic observation and practice. Europe's lead in resourcefulness and creativity, the vital factory in the history of the world for the six centuries preceding our own, were founded in large part on intelligent grasping at opportunities offered by the civilization of Islam. And that came through Spain. 
Islamic Spain was not just an exotic bit of Orientalia, quaintly moored in the Iberian Peninsula, which has left behind some pretty flotsam for tourists to take photographs of. It played a significant part in the formation of the Old World's civilization. Historian John G. Jackson, in his essay, The Empire of the Moors, states, Education was universal in Moorish Spain, being given to the most humble, while in Christian Europe, 99% of the people were illiterate, and even kings could neither read nor write. You had Moorish women who were doctors and lawyers and professors. Jewish scholars studied under the Moors and then went to England and set up a scientific school at what later came to be Oxford University. The Moors furnished the knowledge and the Jews collected it. The Jews were intermediaries. The Moors and the Christians were fighting each other and the Jews formed a bridge between them. Mr. Jan Carew states, The Arabs brought the work of dynastic Egyptian and classical Greece back to Europe by translating into Arabic the Greek translations of the Egyptian texts as well as the works of the Greek thinkers themselves. Unlike Christian theologians, who forbade scholars from considering ideas outside of the prescribed ecclesiastical canons of the day, Galileo ran afoul of these restrictions, Islam accommodated new ideas with grace and a civilized tolerance. Steel, named for the city Damascus, was used in the making of swords. Sword blades manufactured in Toledo excelled all others produced in Europe in quality and appearance. These same swords were most effective in the Moorish conquests. In Al-Andalus, there was great regard for human rights. Racial and religious tolerance existed to the complete benefit of the empire. Scholar Jan Carew writes, during their long tenure as ruler, the Moors had set a pattern of peaceful symbiosis in their tolerant treatment of Christians and Jews. For centuries, Muslims, Christians, and Jews had lived side by side, and in many instances had so intermarried that numerous families were part Muslim, part Christian, and part Jew. The teachings of the Prophet, too, had stressed repeatedly that peoples of all races and colors were equal in the sight of Allah, and these teachings were not only preached, but often practiced. Women were not discriminated against and enjoyed an active and important place in the society. Flora Shaw points out, It is interesting to note that in the days of Mohammedan Spain, Moorish women were not confined, as in the East, to harems, but appeared freely in public and took their share in all the intellectual, literary, and even scientific movements of the day. There were women poets, historians, and philosophers, as well as women surgeons and doctors. It was this attitude of tolerance for which the Moors became most renowned. This allowed for the spread of knowledge and the growth of African, European, and Jewish scholars such as Maimonides and Prince Henry the Navigator. These scholars made significant contributions and are remembered today. And finally, quoting Edward Scobie, racial mixing in Portugal as in Spain and elsewhere in Europe, which came under the influence of the Moors, took place on a large scale. That is why historians claim that Portugal is in reality a Negroid land, and that when Napoleon explained that Africa begins at the Pyrenees, he meant every word that he uttered. Beginning with Tariq, the stories of the Moors abound with heroes and their legends. These were people of all sorts, warriors, philosophers, mathematicians, artists. Chivalry and the legends of the knights in shining armor come down to us from that time. One of the best known of these heroes is Antar. According to the scholar Ivan van Sertema, he had an Arab father and an Ethiopian mother and became in time the national hero of the Arabs. He's rather like King Arthur in the English tradition, but in fact, more important because he was a more historical figure. After his death, Antar's deeds were recorded in a literary form entitled The Romance of Antar. And according to A.O. Stafford in the Journal of African History, Antar in its present form probably preceded 
the romances of chivalry so common in the 12th century in Italy and France. Another of these Moorish heroes who is remembered in the Muslim world until today is Ziryab. Born in Mesopotamia in 789, Ziryab, the blackbird, was a singer who became one of the most influential persons in all of the Moorish empire of his time. Ziryab is credited not only for the finesse of his voice, but as well with teaching the people of Cordoba style and manners. Throughout the reign of the Moors, there was ongoing tension and warfare, either from attacks by Christian kings or internal conflict. After the death of Abderrahman III, who was the first real unifier of Al-Andalus, the country fell into cycles of anarchy and power struggles between various local Muslim kings, chiefs, and tyrants. Finally, the king of Seville appealed to Al-Moravids for help. As reported by Lane Poole, a new Berber revolution had taken place in North Africa, and a sect of fanatics called the Marabouts, or Saints, al Moravids as the Spaniards named them, had conquered the whole country from Algiers to Senegal. They were much the same sort of people as Tariq and his followers, and they were ready enough to cross the water and conquer the fertile province of Spain. But these new conquerors very quickly gave in to their newfound comforts, and in 20 years were succeeded by the Almohades. The ultimate impact of Islam, however, must be measured also in terms of the political developments that its presence in the peninsula brought in its wake. Foremost among these is the centuries-long Christian drive toward the south in the politico-religious effort to eliminate the foothold of Islam from the peninsula, what is called, in short, the Reconquista. The Crusades played a great part in the dissolution and eventual defeat of this empire. In the book, Pilgrim's Guide to Santiago de Compostela, published by Italica Press, we have the story of one of the more outstanding instances of the Reconquistas or Crusades. Only the northernmost regions of the peninsula, beyond the fruitful central high plains, remained unconquered by Islam. The harsh and cold climate, forbidding mountainous nature and hostile environment, all contributed to their exclusion from the domains of Al-Andalus. It is little wonder that in these northern provinces, opposition from Islam struck its first roots. In 997, Al-Mansur raided Santiago de Compostela, burned the city, destroyed the south aisle of the church, and carried off its bells to Cordoba. Al-Mansur's intervention was terrible, but short-lived. Bishop Pedro Mesoso initiated the reconstruction immediately. From Richard Fletcher, with the conquest of Cordoba in 1236, the bells which Al-Mansur had looted from the shrine of St. James in 997 were sent back to the Cathedral of Santiago de Compostela. In Portugal, the Moors had been defeated. From Edward Scobie's The Moors and Portugal's Global Expansion, the Moors ruled and occupied Lisbon and the rest of the country until well into the 12th century. They were finally defeated and driven out by the forces of King Alfonso and Enriquez, who was aided by English and Flemish crusaders. The scene of this battle was the Castello de São Jorge, or in English, the Castle of St. George. Today, it still stands overlooking the city of Lashbuna, as the Moors named Lisbon. Finally, in 1492, with the fall of Granada, came the end of the Moorish Empire in Al-Andalus. The keys to the Alhambra in Granada were given over by the Caliph Abu Abdallah, also known as Boabdil, to King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella. This brought an end to one of the greatest experiences of human history. Because of the advances and explorations of the Moors, the time of the Renaissance in Europe was made possible. The explorations of the Spanish and Portuguese navigators were due to the advances of the Moors. The Reconquista, or Crusades, came to a dramatic end. Along with the keys to the citadel came priceless tomes and manuscripts, which would be scattered and burned. Boabdil had surrendered this last 
Moorish outpost without a fight, and his dark-skinned mother, Aisha, had reproached him bitterly, saying, Weep like a woman for what you would not defend like a man. After the defeat at Granada, Ferdinand and Isabella had given the Moors the rights to continue their lives and systems in Spain. They were answerable only to Moorish courts, maintain their customs and religion, and converts to Islam were not to be reconverted as Christians. But after only 10 years, the Spanish monarchs were to go back on their word. We get from Jan Carew, Queen Isabella of Castile, whose religious zealotry and greed for confiscated Moorish and Jewish property outstripped that of her husband, abrogated this agreement. It was Isabella who appointed the infamous Spanish Dominican Tomas de Turquemada as Inquisitor General. She also signed the edict ordering the expulsion of the Jews on March 31, 1492. From the moment the ink had dried on that order, the fate of the Moors was also sealed. It would only be a matter of time before their turn came to be forcibly expelled. This precedent established a tradition of treachery and racism that was adopted by all of the European colonizers who came in the wake of the Spanish, and it would endure through the Colombian era. From Stanley Lane Poole, in 1492, the last bulwark of the Moors gave way before the crusade of Ferdinand and Isabella, and with Granada fell all Spain's greatness. For a brief while, indeed, the reflection of the Moorish splendor cast a borrowed light on the history of the land which it had once warmed with its sunny radiance. Then followed the abomination of desolation, the rule of the Inquisition, and the blackness of darkness in which Spain had been plunged ever since, and beggars, friars, and bandits took the place of scholars, merchants, and knights. So low fell Spain when she had driven away the Moors. The decline of the Moors in Spain signaled the closing of the ancient world and enabled the approach of the modern era. The great explorations of the Portuguese and Spanish, and later the English, French, and Dutch, were enhanced by the knowledge of the Moors. The astrolabe and invention of the Moors gave these sailors and navigators confidence to undertake such risky journeys. The pilot on Columbus' first voyage was indeed a Moor. The experience and legacy of the Moors allowed for the rest of Europe a departure from their dark ages. Edward Scobie declares, without the knowledge, intellect, learning, and artistic brilliance of the African Moors, this Renaissance Portugal would have never, and I repeat, never come about. Moorish influence is alive today in Spain and Portugal. In those country, one need only listen to the music of the Fado and Flamenco to hear this influence. To walk in their streets and through the remains of the Moorish castles, which are treasured as their heritage. The people, too, reflect the Moors still. The stubborn fact remains that at the height of its power, the Moorish Empire in Africa stretched from the western half of Algeria through Morocco and as far south as Ghana, while in Europe this empire extended itself from the Atlantic coast of Portugal through Spain and across the Pyrenees to the Rhone Valley in France. And now, five centuries after the fall of Granada, the rainbow array of colors and racial types that one sees in the faces of the contemporary population of this region, from blonde and blue-eyed through various shades of brown to black, is not all that different from what it was in the Moorish Empire of the 10th century, despite new genetic infusions by migrants and successive waves of settlers. During a recent trip I made to Portugal and Spain, I was told in the Algarve region of southern Portugal that the people of that region were Africans, while the people of the north were Europeans. With the fall of this great empire, and the iniquities of the Spanish Inquisition came the end of the dominance of Africa. After the fall of Granada and the subsequent expulsion of the Moors and the Jews, the intolerance and injustice of racism held sway. We finish with comments by Jan Carew. Western scholarship has characteristically dragged its feet 
on the issue of the historical significance of the Moors. Very little has been offered within the classroom. The Moors' largely obscure fate, however, is not due to his insignificance in the history and development of Western civilization, but rather to the judgment passed upon him out of jealousy of his great influence. While most high school and college students are familiar with the classical renaissance of Europe, complete with Greco-Roman literature and the art of Michelangelo, few of them have ever heard of the scientific renaissance in Europe, which took place during the medieval era in the 12th and 13th centuries. Behind Europe's scientific enlightenment, we find many African Muslims. In fact, we find that the very foundation and structure of Western scientific and academe is built upon the erudition of these people known as Moors. Using the fruits of ancient knowledge, which these primarily Muslim people had preserved from the cultures of Kemet, Egypt, and Greece, the Moors and Arabs further developed the ancient wisdom as well as created new areas of science and philosophy. It is the intention and purpose of this effort to participate in the attempts to correct this omission and to provide an introduction for these same students to the remarkable time and peoples of the Moors. Thank you.